Our next speaker is Lark Reber, and she's going to be talking about species delimination of a moss clade and a global hot spot, hot spot for bryophyte diversity. She's uh, been a student at San Jose University and is completing her master's there. She used to work for Apple and several other high-tech companies in the Silicon Valley and has her BS in electrical engineering and computer science. She received a Barbara Castro Research Scholarship to do her research, so I think that's pretty neat that we have her here. So Lark, take it away. Thank you. Um, as she said, I'm Lark Reber. I'm a, a master's student at San Jose State University. And my talk is Species Delimitation of a Moss Clade and a Global Hotspot for Diversity. Now I've got to figure out how to run this thing, right? Um, all right, what's the secret? Whoops. OK, so you've seen these pictures before. Um, in the last last talk, but um, I wanted to use them as a little bit of an introduction to mine. Um, bryophytes are um, we we here in Northern California essentially are a center of bryophyte endemism um, because we've got two endemic regions that overlap the California Floristic Pro Province and the specific region that both are known for a lot of endemic bryophytes um, and as. Ben Carter also mentioned there's been a lot of species discoveries within bryophytes, particularly here in, in California and in Western North America. Um, and I'm going to be looking at a genus of moss called Homalothesium. It has two centers of diversity. One is in Europe, centered around Europe. One is centered around here in Western North America, particularly in Northern California. Uh, the majority of the species reside here in Northern California, so it's uh, fun to work on something that's really local. Uh, it's very pretty moss, as you can see by some of these pictures. Um, and anyway, it's, it's, I, I love it. Um, it's, so this is a basic phylogeny, phy I can't even talk, phylogeny of what is, of the work that's already been done on this genus. Um, there's about 13 or 14 species, depending how you count things. And um, it's, as you can see, most of them are here in Northern California. Um, there is a group that's off in Europe. Um, I'm going to be talking about one specific clade of this, which is that one, where it's like, OK, why is there two species named there? Um, that's a piece of the question. The other piece of the question is this. Pinotifidum, the, the version that grows here in the, of this clade, is typically a very lush moss, grows on rocks. Um, the leaves have um, little to no decurrencies at all. But then you see this other form where it's like a little scraggly looking. You find this growing on leaf litter. I've also found this growing in what I call grassy meadow kind of areas. And it's got these great big decurrencies. And Dan Norris, one of the other authors of the California moss flora, considered this a completely separate species. He did not have an opportunity to write it up before he died. So the question is, is this something different? Or is it, you know, is it different? Basically, is there more one species within Punitifidum? And then sort of the related question is, there's something in uh, the European area around the Mediterranean called Arium. Some people consider it the same as Punitifidum, some don't. So what is that relationship between those? Well, that's the basic questions. Um, basically, the null hypothesis is this is all the same thing. Um, an alternate hypothesis is there's more than one thing, either Arium and Punitifidum, or you know, Arium and Punitifidum and something else, or some combination of something. Um, so I wanted to answer, help answer these questions. So basically, what I did is I looked at a ton of herb herbarium specimens. Um, just examining them, seeing what they looking, look like, look at the morphology of them, and um, then I grouped and defined them into various morphotypes uh, based on what I saw. 
And, um, and then of those morphotypes, I selected samples for sequencing, uh, specimens for each of the Panitifidum morphotypes, and I'm basically using Panitifidum as being uh, the West Coast part of this clade, and then some specimens of the European part of the clade. And then I extracted DNA um, from the following gene regions, the, the ITS1 and ITS2, ATBB, RBCL, and RBL16. These regions were chosen because all of the previous molecular work done on homalothesium had used these gene regions. And then, of course, analyze the results and see what we got. And, and during my analysis, what I do is I use the sequences from the previous study so I can make sure that everything still continued, still fit in and was, in, and was consistent with those study, previous studies. So um, on the morphotyping, I looked at a ton of characteristics. I looked at characteristics of the packet, like how frequently was the, was the branching, were they densely branched, sparsely branched, et cetera. Gametophytic characters, i.e., characters of the leaf and characters of the stems, um, and when I had a, when I had sporophytes, sporophytes are the reproductive structure and the only part that are actually um, diploid in the organism. But you only get about 20, 25 percent of the organism of the spec collections actually have sporophytes. When I had them, then I also described sporophyte characteristics. Um, so I, whoops. So I identified two unique morphotypes, including the, the Dan Morris um, thing with the long uh, decurrencies, and I identified another one that I also thought was unique enough that it might be its own species. And, um, and then I identified several other morphotypes which were potentially misidentified. They didn't exactly fit in a different homalothesium species, but they were intermediate between pinotifidum and another homalothesium species. Then, so this is just sort of the numbers of what I did. So I looked at 446 specimens examined at what I call the packet level, uh, 211 that went under the microscope went under the microscope and I did all these characteristics for all these leaves and sporophytes. And then of those, I selected 72 for DNA extraction. 64 were morphotypes of punitifidum. And when I selected the morphotypes, I wanted to select things across the range of the morphotype, which generally the ranges of all the morphotypes match the ranges of punitifidum as a whole. Um, I also looked I had, there were a number of specimens where the collector had collected two collections at the exact same date, at the exact same time, you know, the exact same date, the exact same place, and when you looked, opened up the packages, they looked different and they came out as two different morphotypes. I thought those would be really interesting, so I had a dozen of those in my uh, specimens that I collected, and then I also sequenced seven additional um, Aryan specimens across its geographic range. And um, I threw in one uh, Hamalothesium natalii because it is the sister sp species to this whole clade of Aryan and Punitifidum. Um, so the four genes in my analysis, I basically concatenated all of them. Only the specimens with one, more than one viable gene were used. Some of my, some of my I don't know if it's extractions or the sequencing, but they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have any results. Um, and then, because it looked to me like that there was a lot of information in the indels and the in insertions and deletions, I used some simple indel coding to code that and include, include that in the analysis. And then I used RaxML, which is a maximum likelihood tool and with 100 bootstraps to do um, generate the tree. I had set up separate ray partitions for the chloroplast genes, the nuclear genes, and the indel encoding. And then the fig tree is what I use for, uh, to visualize all my trees. And so now we can see what the results are. So if you're just looking at, this is everything. This is including all the sequences from all the other previous studies and mine. And basically what you get is I recovered the nearly identical overall phylogeny as the previous papers, which is good. This is a good thing to do. Um, but what I'm really interested in, I don't know if there's a way to show, is that is the part in the bottom, basically that uh, lower clay that includes RM and Punitifidum. So if we look at that, so um, 
So I, here I've color coded by geography because I thought that might be interesting. Um, so the first thing we see is Natalii, which is sister to Arium, comes out sister to it, that's good. Um, and um, the Arium pontificum is in one clade. Okay, so that's not, nothing new, but it's good, good that I still got the same results. The Eurocentric sequences, I, what would be Arium in the strictest sense, do form a clade, which is great, um, but it's not exactly well supported. And then the Pinotifidum, all the Western North America, a giant polytomy. And it's not separate from the Eurocentric sequences. So, hmm, okay. What do the morphotypes look like? All right, so here are the morphotypes. Now they're color coded by morphotypes. Um, and I don't see anything there either. <laughs> All right, so it's like, okay, that's, there's something there though. So, but if you go back to this, the, 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 the overall phylogeny of hemalothesium, now I've added in there the, the, uh, the estimated times when those diverged based on the original uh, Hunan paper. And um, one of the things you'll notice is all of the uh, Eurocentric species are basically a clade. So basically what it really looks like is happening here is, I'll call it Pinotifidum. Um, Pinotifidum and all of Hemalothesium is a West Coast generated set of species. It evolved here. Something happened, something got over to Europe, and then some stuff evolved over there. And what looks like it's probably happening here with Arium is we've got exactly the same thing happening, i.e. something went over there and it's evolving. We just need to wait a couple more million years before we have two species. So um, <laughs> anyway, I had a lot of fun doing my project. I really want to thank the Northern California Botanist Society for helping fund this. Um, also, San Jose State helped fund this, and then I had um, a private donor help with some of the funding. And I want to thank all the people who've been advising, Dr. Carter, Dr. Nisowitz, uh, Dr. Lambert, and Jim Sheva, whose name has come up many times. And um, I've gotten herbarium species from Cal Academy, from San Jose State, from the Missouri Botanical Garden, University of British Columbia, uh, and Karen Galinsky up there was very helpful with all the uh, Washington and British Columbia s specimens. And I also got some couple of my specimens from, from here from Cal State Chico. Any questions? <laughs> hands up, hands up. Hold, hold it really close. Fantastic analysis, but I get trees like yours from the same region, and my I'm starting to see papers in the moss world where they're using genomes and microsatellites and getting different, like much more detailed picture. That would be really interesting. I would really like to do that. Uh -huh. um, but this is only a master's project. <laughs> and um, all the previous data in homalothesium had just used those four genes, so it made sense to just use those four genes. So yes, I would love to do that. That was my question. Given time and plenty of money, what yeah. would you do next? Um, well, there are a couple of things that I actually think are interesting. Um, one of the things that I think is there, one is that, is I think that would be really interesting. And then the other thing I think that's really interesting that nobody seems to have paid any attention to is Arenarium's in the wrong place. It really is in the wrong place. It doesn't really belong with the rest of it. It's outside of, it's sister to a clade that's Brachytheciastrum and the rest of Hemalothesium. And in fact, the original study only had one, only had one sequence for Arenarium. Um, in mine, one of my uh, mixed, my intermediate ones also did turn out to be Arenarium. Um, so now there will be a second sequence for Arenarium. But it's, um, there's been very little done on that, and um, 
I think that's, I think that'd be another area, area that'd be interesting to understand where it really belongs. Hi. Um, you said that you concatenated the ITS nuclear genes and the chloroplast, which makes total sense. I'm wondering if you also made a chloroplast and a nuclear gene uh, tree separately and compared those because you'll see when you get to my talk, my mind goes to hybridization and that would be one clue. So I did, but um, I, I sort of haven't quite finished everything. So I, I did do that, but originally when I, when I did that, I did that without encoding indels. And um, I wasn't quite getting the same tree and it was really bothering me. And I, I, and I could see a lot of information in the indels. So I haven't gone back and redone that with the indels encoded in that. So um, I think that would be really interesting to see the chloroplast with the indels encoded and the nuclear genes with the indels encoded and seeing what those trees look like. Because I, th I think there's, when you, without the indels encoded, there's so much information gets lost. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have a question about this background phylogeny. Um, how many loci was that built with? Um, okay, and so- are they nuclear? or plastum. Okay, so let me go back way, so it's on the very first time I showed this thing, way back someplace. Um, I did show the number in each one of those, there. Um, so that was the number of specimens used, and um, for most of them, it had all four loci. Okay, so is this also concatenated, this background one? I believe so, if I okay. recollect. Do you think that some of these um, interesting placements in the phylogeny could be the result of incomplete lineage sorting? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Is that a, I, there's a hand way back there. Hi there. Did you find that uh, any of the morphotypes segregated into different habitat types, or was there any uh, predictability um, for the phenotype you were scoring? Uh, so the, the trouble with that, with mosses, you have to look at microhabitat, and I don't have that information. I had for most of my specimens substrate information, you know, elevation and, and latitude, but I didn't have like, it, they don't always tell you whether it's shady or how wet it is. And um, I've seen studies um, where a few degrees difference in the microhabitat makes a huge difference to which moss grows there. So I, I didn't have that kind of information. But it would be really interesting. Anything else? Thank you very much.